In our last lesson, we showed how a simple flip-flop circuit, a D flip-flop circuit, and remember how D flip-flops were edge triggered. They stored what was at D to Q whenever they had a change, either a rising edge or a falling edge. We showed how a simple D, D flip-flop circuit could be used to divide a frequency, a digital frequency. So you have a, a pulse train, a periodic pulse train. We could divide the frequency in half with something called a divide by two circuit. It was a really simple circuit, wasn't it? Um, so we simply had our D latch. And so we had the D input, the clock input, then Q and Q bar output. And what happened was we put our frequency into the clock input. Now, what I'm going to do now is use a slightly different, uh, in the last lesson we used a rising edge, we're going to use a falling edge D flip-flop this time. And we're actually going to cascade them. And if you recall, when we cascaded these flip-flops, Every time we added another flip-flop, we divided the frequency in half yet again. Now the circuit itself was actually quite simple. All we did was we took Q bar and we routed it around to input into D. And that way, every time we got an edge on this latch, or excuse me, on this flip-flop, then it would flip the value that was on Q. So we get, for example, a falling edge, which means we get a 1 to 0 transition. Every time there was a 1 to 0 transition on that frequency, then we would grab the opposite of what's on Q, stored on Q, and it would flip. Now if I put a bunch of these in order, let's put a couple more. How about D clock Q, Q bar, and remember you take the opposite of Q, put it into D, and this time instead of driving the clock with a frequency, we drive it with Q from the previous Q. Let's do this two more times. Hopefully I have enough room here. So D clock Q, Q bar, route Q bar around to D, take the previous Q, drive the clock with that guy, and then we'll have one more. D clock Q, Q bar, wrap Q bar around to D, drive the clock with the previous Q, and there we go. And let's go ahead, just for the sake of a little bit of, of uh, I don't know, sanity here, let's go ahead and label these guys. So this Q we're going to call Q0, this Q right here we're going to call Q1, this Q we're going to call Q2, and then this last one we're going to call Q3. So I have three, or excuse me, four divided by two circuits, and they're all kind of staggered. Now, let's go ahead and draw the graph out to see what this output looks like, what the output looks like for these four different cues. Now, we did say that this was going to be a falling edge D flip-flop. So what we're going to do is we're going to identify each one of the falling edges on this frequency diagram. So what does our output look like? Well, let's first take a look at Q0. Now remember, Q0 is the output from the very first one of these D, D flip-flops. And so every time the frequency drops from a 1 to a 0, every time we get that edge, we're going to flip Q0 to the opposite value because the opposite of Q0 is going into D of that D flip-flop. So the way it looks, and we're going to start out with a 0. So it goes from a 0 to a 1 right at this instance whenever the frequency goes from a 1 to a 0. And every single time frequency goes from a 1 to a 0, we're going to flip Q0. All right, and so there is our circuit for Q0. All right, well, I guess we could do the last one, right? Now, 
What does the next one look like? What does the Q1 look like? Well, Q1 is not driven by frequency, it's driven by Q0. So, every time that Q0 goes from a 1 to a 0, we're going to flip Q1. So, we've got a 1 to a 0 transition there, so we're going to flip it there. We've got a 1 to a 0 transition there, so we're going to flip it there. And we're just going to keep flipping this back and forth every time we get a flip in, from a 1 to a 0 of Q sub 0, Q naught. Well, what does Q2 look like? Well, Q2 is driven by Q1. And so every time Q1 does a 1 to 0 transition, Q2 is going to flip. And we're going to start with Q2 as a 0, and then it'll flip, and then it'll flip, and then it'll flip, and then it'll flip. All right. Now, the last step, Q3. Q3 is going to flip every time Q2, what's driving its clock, every time it flips from a 1 to a 0, Q3 is going to flip. So it goes all the way until this transition right here from a 1 to a 0, and it flips. And there you go. We've divided by 2, 4, 8, 16. Now, this may not look obvious right up front, but if you, I don't know, if you kind of look sideways and squint, well, tell you what, let's go ahead and put the numbers down. We'll do zero, 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 zero. So for this first period of frequency, all four of the bits equal zero. Then Q0 turns to a one, but the other day the same. Next step. Q0 becomes a 0 again, Q1 increments. And if we simply go through here and identify each value for each one of these Qs as we go on, well, hopefully you'll see a pattern emerge here. Maybe it looks a little clearer now. What we're doing is we're counting, aren't we? As we keep going through here, 0, 1, 2, so if you look at the decimal values, 0, 0, 0, 0, that's a 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, that's a 1, 0, 0, 1, 0, that's 2, 0, 0, 1, 1, 3, 0, 1, 0, 0, that's 4, and we keep counting up until we get to the last column where we've got 1, 1, 1, 1, which is 15. What happens when you've got 1111? Well, it turns out if you get 1111, you get a 1 to 0 transition on Q0, which is going to flip Q1 to a 1 to a 0, which is going to flip Q2 to a 1 to a 0, which is going to flip Q3 to a 1 to a 0. All four of those bits go back to 0. What we're doing is we're counting, right? And this is a timer or sometimes referred to as a counter circuit. And what a timer counter circuit does, well, it does a whole bunch of things for us. For example, let's briefly talk about a multitasking operating system. A multitasking operating system in a single core, one core, has to have the ability to switch from one application to another application to another application to another application. And the way it does that is it says, okay, tell you what, whenever you, uh, let's just pick a number, let's just say three milliseconds. Let's run this application for three milliseconds, give it a chance to execute some code, then we're going to stop it and we're going to give control over to a different application and let that one run for three milliseconds and then we're going to stop it and then we're going to give control over to another application and give it three milliseconds and when it's done we're going to stop it and then we're going to you know eventually we're going to come back around to the first one but what you give it is these little time slices now how does the operating system know that a time has expired how does it know that enough time has passed well it uses one of these counters now oftentimes it has a lot more bits than just four bits for example, when you're looking at the ARM processor, it has a 32-bit free-running counter. Actually, it's a 64-bit free-running.
counting counter, but 32 bits, 32 of those bits are being used, they're being watched by the operating system to see how much time has passed. And so simply, it, it, it's done very easily. What you've got is this value that's counting up. And then you've got another value, which is basically a memory location. It's a static value, and the operating system can store a value in there. And what it does is it tells the hardware, after you have counted up to this point in time, what we're going to do, and it, or the, the time that matches the static value, so you've got a static value in a memory location, and the counter is counting up and counting up and counting up, and it's comparing, and if it meets that value, it sends a signal to the operating system and it says, whoa, just want to let you know the timer's timed up, timed out, and the operating system's going to go, thanks, I know now I can stop this application from running and store its condition so I can give control over to another application. It's also a great way to simply say, okay, I need to have a one millisecond pulse. You know, how am I going to know that one millisecond has passed? Well, I'm going to do the same thing. I'm going to set this timer up in order to make it so that it, it compares and says, okay, I've, I've noticed that a millisecond has passed, just wanted to let you know. There's another option. Many of you probably ha understand the idea of, of corrupted data or a corrupted application or something where it kind of loses control. Kind of, we've let go of the steering wheel and it's just taken off and it's not doing what it's supposed to be doing. It's kind of in an infinite loop or something. There is a way to make sure that this doesn't happen with the operating system. What you do is you have one of these counters, except instead of counting up, they count down. And the operating system, what it does is it loads a fairly large number in here and just lets it count down. And if the, as long as the operating system still has control, every once in a while it just reloads that timer and it keeps counting, uh, counting down. And it reloads that timer and it keeps counting down and counting down. And if it misses it, and if it doesn't get a chance to reload that timer, and this timer gets all the way down to zero, processor hardware just automatically resets. That's something called a watchdog timer. And it's a way to keep track of things if the processor ever loses control of the system. Because what you're looking at is a system that if I don't, if, if, I, if I don't go through critical code and reload this, opera, this counter, and it gets a chance and I, to get all the way to zero before I get to that critical code again to reload the timer, we think that something has hijacked the processor, something's wrong, and the processor is not executing critical code. Maybe maybe an application is locked up where we've actually not been able to get back to the operating system. You want to go ahead and reset. A good way to see if you've got something corrupted is um, in the operating system and this watchdog timer is not getting reset is if the system runs for just a little bit and then resets and then runs for just a little bit and then resets and it keeps doing it. Runs for a little bit and resets. That means that whatever code was supposed to reinitialize that watchdog timer is not getting executed. And you need to take a look at the software that's running there. So anyway, a very important part of any, of any system is this idea of timers and counters. This is how they work. How? With these simple little divide by two circuits being run by a falling edge triggered flip-flop.